second half of section 13. And we were talking about nuisance the other night and what potentially could constitute a nuisance and how we look at things as a trespass. And we talked a little bit about, um, I don't know where Gary is, but Gary was going to paint his house a garish color in order to try and offend the neighbor who made him tear down uh, the wall of his house that contained his bedroom. And I just a uh, couple things just to, to think about. So then yesterday I'm riding home and uh, I look and to my right and someone's painting a house and it's, it's orange. Um, and not my taste, but then, then I realized a number of years ago I lived in a house that I guess others could see as orange. It was more tan than orange, but the house was orange and it's being freshly painted and it's a big house. Uh, and so then I went online and just looked at a few other things um, just to, to see what might be out there. And on ehow.com, which is a site I've looked at before, uh, they've got a series of things that say how to be an annoying neighbor, um, which is kind of odd that, to me that they would put it out there. Um, but they talked about a lot of the things, uh, or they, they it, 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 actually it's instructions on how to be an annoying neighbor. Right? See, that's what it's called. Um, it measure your property line exactly if your neighbor has a fence or other structure that even trespasses on your property by a millimeter make them move it that goes for tree branches that hang over your fence and by and, and that sometimes becomes problem branches if it's a fruit bearing tree and this, it's dropping things in the land i mean that people will fight about when they've decided to fight um and and it says and if in doubt sue them in court to make sure they have nothing on your property in the public or in the public domain restricted area. Um, it, that's a number one suggestion. File numerous complaints with your homeowners association alleging that the neighbor isn't following deed restrictions. And we haven't, I mean, we talked, just touched on that briefly the other day is obviously some of what you can do on your own land will be uh, restricted with respect to uh, restrictions and covenants and the like. Uh, in our neighborhood, what he put in when he built the, the development is that no one is supposed to have an outbuilding, a shed. Uh, now, a lot of my neighbors do, uh, but that is what he says there. I know my recollection, it's either mine or Professor Malagudi's covenants are you can't store an RV on the property. Um, they simply, the, the, it would violate covenants and the like. Uh, a few of the other things, let the, I mean, and then we didn't talk about this, but this is one of them that you see. Let the grass grow long and the weeds prosper. Don't mow your grass. <laughs> let all the stuff blow into your neighbor's yard. Could, could that be a nuisance? Yeah. Okay. Yes. A nuisance like that aggravates me or a legal nuisance according to the definition you guys gave me? Well, and that's what they're saying. The color of the house, but this potentially is going to annoy your neighbor to the point where it's going to depreciate, de uh, depress the property value. That's a nuisance. I don't like. I mean, listen, I'm not a lawn guy. I keep it low. I keep it cut. It's green. I don't care. But I know my next door neighbor who, did, who moved to Atlanta used to be out there with this little fork just about pulling out little things and then reseeding. And I'm thinking, he must think, who the hell do I live next to? Because I really don't care as long as it's cut and green. Could someone complain about the way you keep your yard as a nuisance? And is that what it is, a nuisance? Because it's an unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of your land. What, yeah. what I do on mine? I don't think you can. You don't think it's a nuisance? No. Now, what about you guys who said it is? You have those homeowners type things where you have to keep your grass. No, we don't have one of those. There's no covenants. There's no restrictions. I just, uh, this happened, I read this in Andover. This was a couple years ago now. And I still think if you actually go down North Street, you'd see it because I think he still does it. I think he still does it. He said, you know what? I decided I'm not going to cut my front yard at all anymore. So I'm going to plant some wildflowers and just let it grow and be a front yard that's all natural. Uh, it's good. So you don't have to cut the grass anymore. And if you went by it, it's right across from the middle school, down on North Street, as you're heading toward in Andover Center. Uh, there's there's an older, well-maintained house, but at that point in time, and I think still, the front yard looks like a lot of weeds. Is that 
But nuisance or is that going great? If you're in compliance with the homeowners association. No, for, forget homeowners associations, forget deed restrictions. There are none, none in place. This is, we live next door to each other in Andover, and my neighbor doesn't bother to cut his grass all year. And he's got weeds and stuff growing up there, and I think that that's going to be an un unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of my land, because I like a nice, nicely kept yard. So keep your own yard nice. So, so you can't complain? I don't think so. so. You can complain, but it's not a nuisance. Right. No. Do you guys think it is? No. So now that's not a nuisance. I can. I thought a minute ago you all saying the yeah, I was. Oh, I mean it's an eyesore. Yeah, there you go. It's what? It's an eyesore. It's an eyesore. So an eyesore is okay. Yeah, you you said you had a case. It obstructs my view. Yeah. To the beautiful ocean, and we have a problem. <laughs> Well, well, let me ask you that. I, is that oh, true? Nice Listen, you might like to have an ocean view, mm -hmm. but you don't have an ocean lot. You want that, you come next door and pay for it. And, and I've litigated those as well, right? I mean, is that if I, and I thought that last case told us this, if I have my house, I can do what I want on my property. You might not want to see my sunroom, blocking your view, but if I'm in compliance with zoning, I'm putting up my son. Right? That's fine. Yes. As long as you can't show violations of some other stuff, I can do that. Go ahead. But you said, what about the boat, though? You said you had a client that wanted to get rid of the other neighbor's boat. He did. So, and you didn't really tell us how that turned out, but it kind of gave me the impression that you forced this guy to get rid of the boat, right? I think that's probably so that, accurate. So, so, okay. <laughs> well, so well, but let, let, let me, let me, uh, not to interrupt Gary's point, but let me just, let me help to make Gary's point. You really want to spend that type of money fighting a nuisance claim when clearly the boat's not going to go anywhere? The likelihood is your spouse has been telling you for years to get rid of that POS in the yard, and now your neighbor's suing you. And even to talk to a lawyer, we're right, we're in Superior Court. If we're going to try to oppose the injunction and we need to move quickly and you got to gather all these assets and everything in place, what's that? Easy? Five grand? Ten grand? So you're telling me that it really is not a nuisance, you just kind of forced them to move uh, forward? Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not asking, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying based on what I heard the moments ago, it sounds like everything's a nuisance. <laughs> well, that's, that's what you were telling me. Huh? No, I don't and, well, then help me to define it further, that unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of the property, because it does sound like, and, and you've had bad neighbors, right? We've, we've probably all had bad neighbors. No? Not, not yes, usually? Yes, I not usually. Oh, you're usually the bad neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> I had my neighbor come over and ask me when I was going to cut my hedges, and I was like, well... Oh, really? Well, yeah. well he agreed to do it. Every spring, I give him a 30 pack of course. Like, <laughs> he cuts the I hedges. I mean, it was a good accommodation, because otherwise it wasn't going to get done. Well, <laughs> No, but, but, but that's right. That's a reasonable thing to do. You want them cut, you can cut them, and here's the 30-pack, and now everyone's good. Um, I, I could see someone talking to Ash someday about that rooster. <laughs> no? Yeah. Um, so, so I guess to me, as I think about this, the standard, and this, this is response in part to Gary's question, the standard almost sounds like it potentially is in the eye of the beholder. So if injunctive relief rests with the sound discretion of the court, the judge at the end of the day, part of it's gonna be who I get the luck to go before, isn't it? Yeah, because what's unreasonable to me is not unreasonable yes, right. to you. And there's gonna be cases probably on both sides of this. And obviously there were cases to support the, the ability to bring that suit, or I, obviously I wouldn't have brought it either. But, and, and there's also, we had a legitimate claim as the client related and as the data set. Of course, it supports his claim, so you've got to look at it a little skeptically that to some extent it was an attractive nuisance because children would be drawn to it as well, and there was some danger to it. It wasn't completely aesthetic, but don't minimize how aesthetics motivate people 
to, to take action against their neighbors potentially in this situation because it oftentimes is aesthetics. So that's what I've tried that, that tree hugger you talked about that's letting the grass grow. <laughs> Probably a Democrat, right? But anyways. <laughs> no, I think he's one of those right wing whack jobs, yeah, you know. Probably. But anyways, I would I would probably try to go after him with um, um, what deer ticks because because they get long grass. You know? well, well, what about that? What about like it's a public health issue? They, they like the, the argument is the deer ticks like the taller grass, and now those ticks, since our, our neighbor's uh, uh, property adjoins, those ticks are more likely to get in my yard. That's Lyme, and I, can get, I could probably get someone to say ticks, I obviously could get someone to say ticks bring Lyme disease. Lyme disease can be a debilitating il illness, and therefore this this is a this damages my property both economically and potentially risks. Uh, my exposure to very serious injuries. And weeds too, dandelions and stuff, they come blowing over to my grass. So that's a trespass or a nuisance now? <laughs> well, maybe we have both. You well, what, what, what do you think? Because you were saying, no, I don't see how those tall um, weeds, are, are the tall grass is a problem. We don't, we still don't. There's a couple of others here I just want to mention to you quickly before we get to our cases. Uh, paint your house. We talked about that. Lime green or some other garish color. Make sure the trim and paint don't match. Um, and, and that should help to uh, upset the neighbor. And then there's some things that I think clearly are closer. Six is breed dogs on your property. Um, which sounds to me like you potentially are going to, I mean, have commercial restrictions on activities in residential neighborhoods as well. Um, but, but what about this? Some of you have had this situation. <laughs> Maybe Sandy can comment on it. You know, what about that barking dog in your neighborhood? I know your dog stops barking, Sandy. <laughs> but but what, what about that, the barking dog? You know, sometimes my sometimes that's my dog. If I if he cause just they like they get out and they like to bark. I mean, I, I, they're leashed, but they like to bark. They're sort of barky dogs. Is that is a barking dog? It depends if it's once in a while or if it's you know. Who's not early in the morning? Sometimes six a.m. Every morning. The rooster. My neighbor. Six a.m. every morning. <laughs> Gary's nodding his head. Yes. What are you saying? I said my neighbor. She complained about our dog. Um, at our older house in Augusta, but it didn't matter what time of day. She was always complaining, but she was a, a elderly woman, and she was just very, very nitpicky about everything. Everything. Well, a barking dog can 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 disturb your I mean, dog peace dog. and enjoyment. Be quiet. Quiet. I mean, I mean, he he didn't when he was asleep. Of course, he wasn't barking. So you're not willing to take steps to do anything about this barking dog? No, I didn't. But she, but she definitely tried to call um, animal control just in the fact that. The dog, I mean, it's a dog, is outside, it's 12 noon, it's, it barks. When How long had, had, had he been outside? Well, he was outside, you know, just playing around the yard. Day, like most of the day? No, no one said that. <laughs> I mean, but he stayed right there in the sunroom. But things yeah. are different in Georgia. It's more land. I mean, like, yeah. seriously, lady, relax. And <laughs> What about this last one? Well, there's two. I'm not going to even read. One of them says, "Leave pieces of garbage in your yard that can blow to the others." <laughs> and then that's seven. Eight was, encourage your children to play to play in front of the neighbor's house. Could, 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 could children in their own yard be a nuisance to a neighbor's yard? Yeah, I have a couple. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well. So they shoot hockey pucks over my yard into my pool. Oh my god, it drives me crazy. So I finally stole them all and I won't get them back. Oh, you're that lady in the neighborhood, huh? I have, I bet Sammy, I have I'm kind of surprised at that. Show. I have 50 of them. At least, I bet. They're inside my pool. You should run them out. They're inside. Well, you know, I have return them, like I throw them back over, and then they keep coming, so I finally kept them. I have like 55. My kids are all older, they don't play hockey, so I don't know. Maybe I'll donate them. So. <laughs> okay, so wait a minute. So is that is that a nuisance or is that a tra first of all no. trespass a nuisance? Well, that's a trespass. Because they're children. Though. So, but what's that mean? So, but they're children though. They, they have a defense. <laughs> well, infancy is a defense to what the trespass. Uh, but it is it is an intentional invasion. They intend to shoot the puck where it goes then, right? Those are the, the sort of the bow and arrow cases and all the rest of them. Um, 
best defense is a good offense as she converted their property? <laughs> No, because you, right, you do, yeah, you I do find yeah. I, the, kid, the kids uh, across and above me, they play lacrosse. And I always say, I'm going to cut the lawn sometimes, and I find those damn, the, the hard balls yeah. in the yard, or the mower, I should say, the mower finds <laughs> 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 You know, <laughs> kids. <laughs> Not quite as bad as you. I'm going to give them back. They'll be a little chewed up. <laughs> but, but what about that? I mean, so is that, because... This, this actually, I do want to tie this to Gary's point. What is your advice to these neighbors when they come in? Because people come in with all these disputes, these problems, and, and you tell them to work it out, you tell them this is very expensive, we can do certain things. The law obviously favors uh, some relief in a lot of these situations. Um, and that, that's, I'm going to leave you with, the, I've got two what that I want to work through the rest of the day. Um, I had, uh, the neighborhood I grew up with is in the city, it's in Dorchester, and you know, like across the street is a 7-Eleven, no, what's it, a 7-Eleven, Doherty's Variety, and there were some retail stores, sort of mixed use, and you, you'd see that in Dorchester where you're walking down the street and all of a sudden there's an auto body shop. Um, and then there's some insurance office and then there's people above, it, above these structures. These people, when I was in Boston, they moved in to this neighborhood. Uh, and immediately behind them um, is probably the largest auto body shop you've ever seen in your life. And they did all the police work, they did the fire work, and it had been there since I was little. And now I'm a lawyer and they've come in to see me and they say, we moved in, and you know what? There's an auto body shop you know, right behind our house, and we smell paint. Now, that auto body shop was there since I was an infant, okay? and so. My question to them, first at least was initially, was well, didn't you expect to smell paint if you're near an auto body shop? And so she wanted to know what she could do. Uh, because obviously the inhaling of the fumes is problematic, even though it had long been grandfathered in from a standpoint of zoning and the like, and it really had been there honest, uh, probably virtually, the neighborhood was probably built pretty much around this, um, Manufac not manufacturing, this business facility. Uh, we have another problem in, in North Andover, where I live now, um, and I actually got a whiff of it yesterday as I'm driving up Sutton Street on my bike, uh, getting to near that orange house I talked to you about, and I said, hmm, but it's not as bad as it's gonna be in July. We have a sewage treatment plant there. Um, and the sewage treatment plant, when it gets riper, and it'll get riper in another month and a half or so, and the wind blows, instead of blowing, <laughs> towards the Merrimack and South, it comes back to town. Honest to God, it's, it's, it would gag you. And if you lived in that neighborhood, it would really gag you. And what the neighbors have asked many times is, why can't you do something more about this? Uh, one very costly solution they propose from time to time is about a seven to $10 million cap over the sewerage lagoons, just to cap them actually, so then the smell would be self-contained. And the sewerage treatment uh, plant says, we can't afford $10 million in additional costs. It doesn't happen that often. Um, frankly, again, just like the situation I described to you with the auto body shop, um, <laughs> you bought a neighborhood that's right adjacent to the sewage treatment plant, it's not gonna smell like roses. Uh, and you shouldn't expect it to. I, I had a third client I'll tell you about, they bought um, next to a uh, elementary school, which I thought was great down in Brockton because our kids could go right across the street and not have to worry about it. Uh, what they didn't know is that those, the, the, the buses that take the kids to school and then they pick them up sometime in the afternoon, leave those diesel uh, engines running um, so that they don't have to turn them off and have trouble starting the vehicle. And, and she would say, and, and I believed her, and there was some support for this, that the house would fill, if they had the windows open, the house would fill with diesel fumes. Diesel fumes make me sick. Um, and if your house was full of it, it would be debilitating as well. So I'm wondering what you're gonna do for these people, uh, the various people in this group as you start to think about their, their problems. And so help me with some of this uh, as we start to look at our cases today. Uh, are all of those situation nuisances? Uh, can you do something for any of them? Oh, what are you gonna tell the client that comes into your office? Sandy says, I'm done with these pucks. No, really, right? I'm done with them. I don't want the kids playing there. I don't want to have to be cleaning out my pool. I worry that they're going to do damage to my pool. Um, 
And even what if, what if that was just the sound of the, the, the hockey stick hitting the puck? Over and over and over again. I think about this kid I used to know uh, from Dorchester again. He was Canadian. He really wanted to make it to the pros. He used to lug this big old wooden net back then out over to the park. And then he had a couple of five gallon buckets of pucks. And he would he must have he must have hit thousands of pucks in a period of a couple hours into that net. The idea was to obviously get better so that he'd be good enough someday. But you know, it didn't bother us. But if you're sitting next to listening to pucks get hit for like a couple hours, especially if it's entering into your premises, I could see where it'd be problematic. What's your advice to these people? Because the likelihood is you will deal with some of these. I mean, your advice is how much money you got, we're good to go. You want to give them the good neighbor speech when you're out to try and work it out. I mean, what are you, what are you going to do for them? What, where do you go? Because you've read the cases, you can understand what the law is. And so I guess I'd like to know where, where you would start. If uh, some of these folks came in to you, some of the folks I've described to you come in. Uh, you know, Boomer versus Atlantic Cement. We don't have a lot of cement plants left, but you ever see that? And, and I think it's getting closer and closer. Um, if you, as you come into Boston, Boston sand and gravel, if you're coming in on the, the, the commuter rail, um, it looks like those neighborhoods are getting closer and closer to Boston sand and gravel and you don't necessarily want to live next to those trucks coming and going with all the dust that's attendant to it. Um, so so what's your, what do you say? Don't you think in my case there's 50, I have a good 50, 55 bucks. You might think that I've already done my due diligence to try and get them to stop. So why not? It's a new so, so why not what? What, why not what? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> why not sue them? Sue them. Yes. And judge them. We want yeah, you to prevent your little yeah. children, or At children. At this point, yeah, there's 55. Think of all that. They're trying to make the hockey team. Well, yeah, we're trying, they didn't. <laughs> Well, what, put up the net. We haven't talked about those cases, right? The golf co golf courses and the like. There's one. There's a driving range back here. They've got the high nets, but if you go into the woods back there. If you were just walking through the woods, you'd, you'd be able to pick up lots of golf uh, balls. Put a net where? Well, why can't? On my property line? Yeah. Well, that's really an eyesore. Why would you want me to do that? Well, well, wait a minute. Well, why could well, maybe maybe they should do it? Is I think what the suggestion no. was. Like, why would I? Well, well, wait a minute though. Would that be okay with you? Because probably not. Because you just said it's an eyesore. Probably not. No. So you don't like that solution either. No. Well, could they put it? They could say, "Oh, listen, I'll take care of it. You won't have to worry about another puck getting into that pool, Sandy. We're going to put up a twenty high, twenty foot high property line, seventy five feet." Maybe 30 feet high, just to be safe about it. <laughs> Looking at your face. 30 feet high, um, orange uh, mesh net fence to keep those pucks out of your pool. And then we won't have to deal with this anymore. But by the way, you should expect that type of response, right? Yes. If you, if you think you're going to poke me, yeah. the big dogs bite back, don't they? Cheaper than a lawyer. Cheap, cheap. <laughs> And a lawyer. <laughs> and so, uh, do you have that conversation? You should understand this various thing, anything can happen here virtually in, in equity. And so, yeah, we'll go in and try and get an injunction. But you should understand, or, or is that we just have to, it, it, you should understand there are various things that can take place, and your, the lawyer, as the defendant's lawyer, might choose to poke back too. Would you, as the defendant's lawyer, poke back? I mean, you obviously know she doesn't want a 75-foot lawn, 30-foot high, orange mesh net fence against her property. Wouldn't match. Say, that's cute. That'd be cute. No, it wouldn't match. I have a well, fence. an I have orange a might be too much. Maybe it's just a clear net. <laughs> Not clear. I mean, what? You know? They can put it up when they uh, we're going to play hockey track. That way you don't have to see it all the time. Oh, I would do that. But I can't stay there all the time. How are we going to monitor that injunction? So, or, or even the agreement? So we'll we'll have what little Johnny and Jimmy pull up the 
this big screen when they decide to play hockey. Hockey. None of you have children because I mean, obviously, <laughs> that you expect them to do exactly as they are required. Because um, it sounds problematic from standpoint of both compliance and expectations of what children tend to do. We want to play hockey. We want to play hockey. We don't want to have to worry about old lady you Sandy. Listen, I don't disagree with you. I'm telling you, I get, I get, the, the, I get the lacrosse balls in the yard. And the then the golf balls too. And golf balls were worse with the damn lawnmower, obviously. <laughs> Because then that becomes potentially dangerous. Yeah, I have a basketball. Get those. There's a soccer ball. You have, have you two have a tennis ball so far. Would you have guessed this? I've heard that, that having had her dog killed by another neighbor, <laughs> shot, not killed, <laughs> shot, that she would then be the woman that steals the kids' toys. <laughs> I used to think like that my coming up. <laughs> Well, does that make it yours, so? Huh? Okay, but wait a minute. I need to know what your advice is here because I like to think of lawyers as problem solvers, and all I'm, all, I'll be honest, a little bit of what I'm not hearing is we're off to the races here. I am hearing we're off to the races. We're going to make some good bank on this case because in these they, they do because people then get, it all gets very personal. Um, people get very angry, and we're gonna we're gonna litigate this. Well, what's the difference? She's all, uh, to me. I'm gonna use my case. She's already angry. So and why is she not, angry? You're, oh, because you're, you're taking her pucks. I'm taking her kids' pucks or something. I don't know. I'm always Has she over said that? On the door. She said once. Oh, you Oh, go ahead. What? I'm always over there knocking on the door, asking her to tell them to stop doing that. I mean, a couple times the hockey puck hit almost the window of the house. It's hitting the siding, dent my siding. So I mean, I've done it. Like I feel like forever, and I won't sue her because I feel really bad for her mother. That's really why I'm not doing it. She has a really fragile mother. Huh? We just put up the net. Take your house. She doesn't want the net. She doesn't want. She's got a pool back there. I just think that they shouldn't. These kids are old enough. They shouldn't be doing it. How old are the kids? Hmm? Probably 16, 17. And I think they do it just to piss me off. Well, yeah. now they probably did. <laughs> no, they have. So, so tell me what your. I need to know what your advice is. So, but well, that's what I mean. I don't know. Because I mean, in that case, I wouldn't know what to do because I would. I don't. I well, really but at some point, you, you know, one of the times the little kids are going to hit the puck, they're going to see you in the eye. They're going to hit the puck, to rip the lead you pool, you're going to look, and they're going to flip you the bird, and you're going to decide, I don't care about the sick mom, I'm doing something now. Well, that's true, because that's how it's getting for me now, because as you know, I have a handicapped son, so he's out in the yard all the time. So that's becoming an issue now that the good weather's coming. You know, it's a fear for me. So I don't know. So I, I want to know what your advice to her is when she comes into your office and says, I've had enough. Sue would have to sue, especially with your child. It could be a problem. At this point, I would say so. Well, I mean, she's trying to talk to them and reason with them, and obviously. So, so when you say talk to them, reason with them, so we're going to send a demand, tell them to cease and desist, or words to that effect, what does she or we will yes. sue. Yes. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Is that, is that, do you all agree to that? Yes. That's yeah. Is, is there any, does she need to document her history of this Not interaction? With well, the you tell me, you're all the lawyer. I, I would think to cover your own backside on Rule 11 here, yeah. What What do you What do you need to proceed? Because she's ready. And the Take pictures of the dented siding. I have everything. I don't need anything. She's kidding. <laughs> No, but you do. You want to review it, obviously. All oh, okay. So you, you'll review all of this. Um, Let's file it up. You're gonna get a check from her. No, none, none of you have tried to discourage her. None of you have said this could be a long, drawn-out battle. You really want to do this with your neighbor? No. Uh, no. I'm sorry, yeah. Huh? I think it would depend on the circumstances. I think. For well, what's yours? We're going to use case, you right now. For my yeah. case, yeah. I think that I, I as the owner, have done everything as well as my husband, doing everything to try and get these people to stop or well, rectify. When people are at the point you're presently at, this, that's what they feel too, right? Because they do. They feel, well, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to live with it anymore. I've done everything I can. That's why they come to us. Maybe make a report with the police. What's the report? What the police say? Hey, the kid next door is throwing shooting pucks. Oh, I I call there's there's oh, substantial call damage to my property. Is there substantial? I mean, sir, I mean, I'm just, I'm not, I'm just we, saying. You, now the police come out and say, you see that little dent right there? <laughs> no, just so uh, right. Normally, uh, by the way, normally it's it, the good suggestion. I think it's an excellent suggestion to try and document with not just the police but other town boards and the like the the potential violations so that you have some. 
some further support for violations of the ordinances that you guys were telling me last time as well. Um, but I wonder whether the police are going to come out and see this as a serious problem. But the police are oftentimes involved in these neighbor disputes as well. And they, at some point, they throw up their hands because... They've been out four times. Oh. And they're done. They're done. Oh, so you got police reports then, at least. Yeah, they're done. What were they about four times for? Because the one time it was close to the, um, I didn't call my husband called, it was because the um, puck came close to the window. Okay. So, of my son's room. So, the window of my son's room. So, that they were called then. Then when, um, I had a dog at the time, and um, it came okay. over and it got in the dog's area. So, my husband called again. There was a few stupid I thought stupid reasons to call the cops. I think it's tough to call the cops for that. But they came in by the fourth time. I mean, they went over and knocked on the neighbor's door and said, you know, you really need to have the kids stop doing this. Yep, slap on the hand and walk away. It was really nothing. Why can't they shoot in a different direction? Well, if, if, if they shoot one way, it's going to be shooting at their own house. If they shoot the other way, there's another house. And then if they shoot the other way, it's the street. So why did your house win? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. Well, is that I'm just curious. You <laughs> asked them to stop. What do they say? No. The woman says, all I can do is try and get my kids to stop. That's what she says all the time. She goes, I've tried. I've tried. She says all the time. Why? Why? I mean, I have I kids. Would you would too. Sunshine would too. I, I like your the way you said talk to your neighbor because you're probably going to live there 30 years and that's your house. But but in this instance, I would send a demand letter or we will sue. And I would document yeah. in that letter all of the times because then oh, yeah. it'll be evident to them, like, really, she's really worried. Just threaten to send it. Well, I, when you spend the money on a $200, $300 on a, on a demand letter from an attorney, say, you left me no choice. I have to call an attorney. It's going to cost us both a ton of money because your kids won't shoot the puck in another direction or hit the net. But Maybe. apparently, everything she's done isn't working. Yeah, well, so if she chooses to pay honor. me, I'll take the money and write the letter. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> right. She's exhausted her, you know, She's all, all her options. And the other point about this, the documentation, is that, you know, it took us a while to get to this point. It's going to take a while for the judge to get to the point about, so you want, so, and I guess maybe that's my question. What is it you want the injunction to say? Because you've got, what, a two-count complaint? It's some, is that correct? Nuisance and trespass? And damages, I mean, well. well can, can you damage. document a case of damage for the... Injuries to your property? For the, for the siding of the house, I could, I guess. Like how much do you think the damage is? Well, at this point, I'm probably going to have to replace the siding around that window. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, around the whole window, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she's got a couple hundred dollars. Whatever, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 bucks, we'll say. Does that sound yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, and you, so you're going you're gonna to have her get the estimate. And so now, what's your injunction say? What does the order actually say that you're asking the, me to issue as the judge? To have the neighbors refrain their children from playing like during certain times. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah, I like I like activity. athletic yeah, I mean, activities at her property. And you said it's more, it's more than hockey, right? Right, it's all. Yeah. So what's it? So I think it's the hockey. It's the problem. It's the pucks flying it's into your the house. Pucks. It's the pucks. It's the hockey outside. So you wouldn't have a problem with uh, street hockey balls? I don't know. I don't even know what those are. What are they? What do they, look like? <laughs> they look like a lacrosse ball. They're they're hard. They are. Yeah. Same thing. Okay. So so I, again, I need to know what the order says. You want the court to issue an order that says what? Titi said playing outside, but then she retracted that. Yeah. Obviously, obviously you're not going to get an order that prevents the children from playing yeah, children outside. Playing, play play sports. playing hockey so they can play lacrosse because that ball whips. That's, that, uh, it's the one with the triangular net, and the ball really moves. I broke so many windows with soccer balls. With soccer balls, even? Yeah. No ball no. games. <laughs> no ball games in the yard. Do you think you can get that order? No dangerous. No. But, I mean, what's the other option? Why Why not not just, no, no, stop with whatever option. Now, uh, this is a practical application of this. What does your order say? Because you've got to write it, and I will approve it. But it better say exactly what you want. It carries with it the threat of contempt. But again, we're not nice neighbors anymore. Whatever it doesn't say, I'm going to do. That's the way it is. You've declared war, right? I, well, listen, the other side is represented by someone. Tell me what we can and can't do. It says you can't play hockey. 
Okay, kids. Yep. Well, well, the rest of them. So, well, they don't care if they play hockey. You don't want them damaging your property. Mm -hmm. Damage is trespass. Right. So, 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 what, so the order should say cease and desist any trespassing on X property. Well, trespass is a conclusion of law. I think you need words that say it. Prevent, to stop what? Um, Persons or objects. Yeah. Stop entering onto my property. Persons or objects from entering on to Sandy's property. Right. Mm -hmm. The defendants are hereby ordered to stop per any persons or objects under their control, say, right, yeah, probably, control, from yeah. entering on to Sandy's property. And causing damage. Well, no, so as long as they enter without causing damages? And or. Leave that out. Isn't it? It's, uh, so, so that's your order. Because that order on its face doesn't sound unreasonable, does it? Because you don't have a lawful right to be either you personally or things under your control sending them on to someone else's property. Okay? Okay. Are they loud when they Is there an argument against that, getting that? So they're not loud, it's just unsettling. Okay. What, where, so where are we at? The, 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 any of you representing the parents or the children opposing this? Go ahead. I do it. Of course, I, I would try, try to argue that the kids were there when you moved in. Hopefully. They weren't. I would say that. <laughs> kids will be kids. You can't, you know, how can you control them? That kind of thing, you know. Hands the ball through the way. Kids got to play, right? You can't stop the kids from playing, Your Honor. You can aim at your own house. But, and that's right, right? I mean, that's partly, you can't stop them from playing, but at the same point, we can stop you from interfering with our use and enjoyment. Or just yeah. shift the direction. Right. They, we're not saying they can't play hockey or any other ball and bat game they want. What we're saying is you can't be sending projectiles onto Sandy's property. Oh. What if they were just loud kids? You know, I'll be honest, sometimes when we play, we'd be really loud. And again, growing up in the city, we, the language wasn't always that polite either. <laughs> right, Sandy? Yeah. <laughs> so what about that? All kids are loud, Your Honor. So, so, uh, go ahead. I, I, would, I would go to the reasonableness of that, saying, I mean, it depends what time it is. I mean, if it's like 12 o'clock in the afternoon, it's it, it's reasonable. It's, it's, it's to be expected that kids would be up there at that time, be allowed and playing. Um, it's almost encouraged the kids are outside to be out there and playing rather than be, you know, sitting inside. But I mean, it would definitely be unreasonable when it crosses that line when it's, you know, late at night, early in the morning. So time, the time becomes important as to what's reasonable and it's not. I think I think we'd all agree with that. The, 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 the uh, yeah. location of the activity, like it's going to be noisier in the city than the country. Does it general matter? No. Uh, yeah. Uh, but what about his rooster? Because <laughs> obviously that's obviously his rooster is more accepted in the country <laughs> than it would be if we were living in relatively tight space in the city. So, so partly we'll look at the character of the uh, neighborhood, of, the, of where the use is, takes place. Um, tell me about Boomer, I mean you read Boomer, so I want you to use it in the context of the auto body shop I talked to you about, the uh, auto body, the, uh, what's the other one I gave you? Uh, oh, the, the uh, sewage treatment plant. And you know what, when I read Boomer, I try to think, I, what I think about is not either Boomer or I don't think about those cases. What I think about, how many of you have used Manchester Airport in the last year? Oh, yeah. No? Not from around? Not from this area? Um, what? Probably seven years ago, there was a, the airport probably was the size of the one near me, which is North Andover and it's tiny. And now it has changed, not changed. I mean, change doesn't even begin to describe what it's done to that, the neighborhood that one time existed of a lot of small homes and everything else. Um, and of course, obviously, the Logan Airport has had its problems with its neighbors for decades. Uh, but we need airports. Uh, we need sewage treatment plants. Uh, there's a social utility to some of these functions. Uh, we needed and still need uh, cement plants and sand and gravel, like Boston sand and gravel. Um, how, how do you balance that? How do you balance? Uh, well, someone's got to live near them, but I don't want it to be me. Someone's got to worry about these big trucks spilling their 
dust in there, little stones everywhere. Go ahead. Because I lived in Manchester and grew up at that airport. Oh, did you? Did you? Yeah, I grew up there. But anyways, um, how about within the last ten years? Really, the characters take fifteen. Is it is it as many as fifteen? But in reality, they also paid. I think the federal government paid to have most of those houses remodeled with uh, double pane windows too, and soundproofing. So, and also the other technology, and it kind of relates to Boomer because Boomer, the judge, yep. the, the judge says. You know what? What's the current technology? Um, you've got 18 months, but the point is, is that they could look at it again and say, "Hey, there's newer technology out there." So what happened with the uh, airport also was they went from a turbojet engine to a turbofan engine almost nationally in the same kind of over the same time period, the last 10, 20 years. They've been migrating all the jets. All those old jets that used to make a lot of noise, those, those different type of engines, they sold all those to some other foreign countries, you know, and they got rid of them. So the, the engines are quieter. My mom actually lives right on the approach path for that, for Manchester. Oh, yeah? And it's amazing. You can't see the airplanes anymore because they redid her windows and the new, the new engines and stuff. But that's as long as she's inside, though, right? right? You open your window, but it's still not as bad. It really isn't. And the other thing, too, is... is Could she expect them to pay for air conditioning? I can't open yes. my windows. Yeah. Oh. I can't open my windows during the summer. I want central air. That's reasonable. Yeah. That is reasonable because yeah. it's a nuisance. They did yes. that too. Yeah. They did that too. They, they paid for air conditioning and stuff. So I get, oh. I can get air conditioning. As taxpayers, we did. Right. You're right. Exactly. You, you kind of. I, I get. A, I'm right under a flight path too in Lynn, and I get big, you know, jet liners flying over all the time. You kind of forget about it. After, that's true. That's true. Yeah. after like, like train. honestly, train a week. Yeah. Uh -huh. It is my god. I'm like, oh, I'm done with that. I actually had to like it. Yeah. After a week, yeah. Yeah. once in a while, a really big one comes yeah. along. Yeah. 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 You look at it like, oh, yeah. Was it there before, oh, okay. before you moved in? Logan? <laughs> <laughs> How old do you think he is? <laughs> You can make an argument yeah. that you know it's disturbing me because you got used to the piece. But if it's always been there, then like you said, you'll get used to it. I guess it depends on if it was there. Well, you know, when you say get used to it, and I hear Pat, and I appreciate that, because when I was in Dorchester, they were on the flight path from the south, and you do get relatively used to it. Uh, except, I remember when we graduated law school, we went to a party, a friend, a friend of ours had a house in Winthrop right on the, on the water. And oh my God, honestly, uh, and I grew up in Dorchester, so I'm used to noise. Um, you could not finish a conversation, because they were very, very, in winter, be very close to where they're landing, that it would be incredible, I mean, seriously, like, you just have to stop talking. It wasn't even worth it. The noise got so loud. Uh, and, and so in some places you get used to it, uh, but in other places, if it's that bad, you're going to have these additional problems that we have to worry about. You know, same thing with cement dust and all the rest of it. Same thing for the sewage treatment plant. You could say, well, you'll get used to it. It won't be that bad. Well, not that bad for me because I'm pretty good distance away and maybe even at the house maybe once a blue moon if that we might get a whiff of something and you say oh that's bad but again if you're close to it it's 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 a different problem um, and I think I've told you this before we, when I was in Savannah uh, we just there for uh, a hearing we got out, I got out of the got out of the plane uh, you know got out of the airport looking for a cab standing out there, oh my god what the hell is that smell huh paper meal and they I said, what's that stink and it was a stink and they said <laughs> they, the guy said the cab driver said to me he said that's the smell of money boy uh, because that's how people work and you either decide you want the jobs you want cement you want your sewage treated as opposed to well, I don't know what the alternative would be to get your house. Um, and, and you decide that these are some of it. We need another airport in Manchester. And Gary's mother has to accept that sitting out on her deck these days is not going to be as enjoyable um, when some of the bigger planes land. But those are nuisances, aren't they? I mean, they are, you know, compared to the color of someone's house, the grass is a little high, you know, there's noxious odors. Uh, even the paint fumes, right? Well, unless they're dangerous, right? If you can prove that they're dangerous to health, that would be different. Well, what if they just stink? Yeah, that would be harder, right? Is it? Still Is it? Huh? It's still a nuisance. 
if the, if, the, if the smell is offensive, even if it's not damaging to your health, it's a nuisance. But it limits your use and enjoyment. But if it's a no one. Limits you your use and enjoyment. It smells. Huh? You can't sit outside if it smells. Well, it, it's offensive. But you yeah. also moved there, though. Did you move? So this, you got to consider that balance and the balance test. Well, well, hold on. When you tell me that, because again, I want you to make sure you understand the cases here, right? Is moving moving to the nuisance doesn't necessarily preclude the claim for the nuisance, right? Okay, oh, it makes it harder. Though, right? it, do, it, yeah. it does make it harder, and the court's going to balance some of that. And what, but, but at the end of the day, if you move to it, when they're going to, they potentially, you might still be able to enjoin it, but maybe you have to pay some form of damages uh, to help alleviate the loss to the other side. So, so this coming to the nuisance doesn't bar the claim. Uh, that's the Dell Webb case. Um, what it does say is that maybe we have to look at a sharing of these responsibilities, and equity has the ability uh, to do that. Um, and let's just start to look at here, in my book, it's 317. Um, when we're looking at nuisance cases, uh, the question is, is it permanent and unabatable? Um, and what's the difference between permanent and temporary? One, right? That's, that's as simple as that, right? One can be repaired and one can't. Um, and the same type of thing really with the trespass is that the ability that would make something different between temporary and permanent and it has two, two groups of ramifications to it. One of which is um, if it's permanent, uh, it can't be repaired and so the question is either remove it or eliminate it, or, and then we have to look at what the remedy might be. And if it's temporary, as a general matter, temporary means we can fix it. And fix it means, as more often than not, take it out um, and, and allow that to uh, uh, stand. What this case, Boomer talks about, is that uh, perhaps, and we've seen this in a number of other cases as well, is that maybe instead of awarding um, injunctive relief, um, that perhaps what we should look at is some type of permanent damage award uh, where it will provide damages for past and future uh, and there will only be one recovery um, and under those circumstances uh, that would be more economically reasonable because uh, the, the, the damages would be relatively small compared to the cost of removing uh, the nuisance. And uh, this gets us into this argument about, well, that sort of constitutes inverse condemnation. You're taking their property. Um, in some way, the, the, the non-offending party's property, you're diminishing the value by simply making a permanent damage award, and at the end of the day, uh, whoever buys after that is taking subject to these problems, like this coming to the nuisance issue, is that, well listen, when you, and, I, and I'll tell you, the, the people I had in Dorchester, I felt bad for the auto body shop. But as you guys pointed out, well, since I was born, technology has changed. There are scrubbers, there are other things that can be put there to help alleviate some of these problems. It's always, you're always gonna have potentially some smell, but, but we had not just odors, but we had paint invading the yard at this point. You wouldn't want your little kids to be out there. But at the same point, you probably got a reduced price for that house because you were buying next to an auto body that shop that was about a, almost a block long. I mean, it was huge. It was huge, and to some extent, some of this should have been anticipated. Uh, what about this whole notion of permanent damages? Uh, is is that uh, is is that wise? Because it, it the case does talk about. Um, so in essence. You're diminishing the value of the plaintiff's land and allowing the nuisance to proceed, to continue forever now. Um, and, and if in fact it's a nuisance, why shouldn't it be abated if it could be? Is it because we need cement plants, we need airports, we need yep. sewage treatment plants? It is, right? Right. It, it is, isn't it? I mean, that's, you know, you want your sewage treated, someone's got to live next to it, there will be times where it's offensive. 
You know, you guys all did, uh, most of you did, I think you all did back then, the Dooney and Farms case, right? You, you want your fruits, you want your vegetables, you want your milk, you want your fresh everything, but geez, sometimes living next door to these things is, is terrible. I remember we used to take the kids when the cows were up the hill, we'd go up when they were little, and one day we turned the corner and oh my God, the smell was rancid. Um, and I, I found out that what, what it is, it's, it's the corn that, that they feed the cows that then rots, coupled with sour milk. Uh, from the cows, they, they were dairy cows, and honest to God, uh, as, you, as I turned the corner that day, you, you could have vomited right away, um, and it was just terrible, <laughs> yeah, you know, but, but those are farm smells, right? Um, my brother lives up in Maine, near, uh, lived, he used to live further outside the city, near the Turner Egg Farms up there, and during the summer, uh, those those egg farms can get really nasty, um, but we need farms too. So tell me where you go with that. It's balancing and equity can do what they want at the end of the day. Okay, tell me about Pate versus City of Martin then. And the next time you think you have a really bad job. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Drive the motorboat around. You remember this poor guy in in the motorboat. Yeah. He gets to do boating for a living now. In the sewage lagoon. That's right. You got to got to look at it positively. It, is that okay? I mean, because this is this is our sewer treatment plant problem in North Andover. Sometimes we have we have a problem that can be abated more reasonably. Obviously, depending on where you live, you might like a permanent solution that we don't have to do anything with. Um, is it is it all this flexible? Because it does seem like if we send a little guy out there with a motorboat, churn the scum at the top of the pond, and as long as that's done on somewhat of a regular basis, there isn't a problem. Why do we have to do more? I agreed with the case. It seemed like the city wasn't doing as much as they needed to do. I think they said uh, something about the city abandoning it and that they're in action because they did it half-heartedly and they only did it for a s short period of time and then they stopped. Adding more enzymes doesn't seem like it's that costly. And causing them to do that, I mean, at least it shows that they're doing something. So they're taking steps, but I think the city kind of just gave up until this lawsuit. So I agree with it. You think it's a, a just result? Yeah. Okay, you all do, it sounds. Uh, so the damage award, even though there are, there are less, um, well, let me ask you about that. So could they come back again for another damage award if it's not? Well, actually, they said here it was a permanent nuisance and awarded appellants 10,000 in damages. I thought you already, I thought you just told me moments ago that a permanent nuisance is one that can't be abated, where this one can be, can't it? Yeah. Yes. So, so it's not really a permanent nuisance, is it then? This is a temporary nuisance because you yeah, have to do something about bad. it. Well, but you've got, I'm, I'm looking at the first paragraph and first I see it says, uh, was maintained by the city of Martin was a permanent nuisance awarded 10 grand in damages. The chancellor, so that, is that, so that goes to past? Because that says the chancellor also found that an injunction would be too harsh a remedy and should be denied. The court of appeals concurred in the, in the finding that the lagoon was uh, maintained as a nuisance. However, they said it was temporary rather than permanent. So throws out the 10 grand. Um, on the basis of the diminution in value of the property. Um, and they dismissed the action for failure to prove damage for impairment of the use and enjoyment, which was that basis for the damage award. So so I want to know what it is you're agreeing with here, because that's the start of it. And at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, the court says, no, 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 no. Uh, the district court was closer than the appeals court. Uh, because they said the judgment of the Court of Appeals dismissing the action is reversed 
it's remanded to the Chancery as an equity court for entry and enforcement of a mandatory injunction directed to the abatement of the dues since and for the taking of proof on the issue of damages. So they're, they're saying, no, there's, an, there's a nuisance and it can be abated. And we already know one way it's abated is by the use of the little tidy bowl guy going around this, the sewage treatment plant, right? So, so that's what tells us it's fixable. Um, and then the question is, they should get damages for the past diminution in value or how it's affected their use and enjoyment. It says here on page 47 in mine, it says a nuisance has been defined as anything which annoys or disturbs the free use of one's property or which renders its ordinary use or physical occupation uncomfortable. Wow, that sounds pretty low. And then it goes on to say, and these are, these are not cases from our jurisdiction, but they're from Tennessee. It says, it was said that a nuisance extends to everything that endangers life or health. Okay. Or gives offense to the senses, violates the laws of decency, okay, obstructs the reasonable and comfortable use of the property. Offense to the senses. Again, that sounds kind of low. Smells, sights, Huh? Uh, you know, how you define offense to the senses. Well, and that's, it sounds pretty broad, and it sounds like we're going to leave it to the court to make those determinations. Uh, are you comfortable this was a temporary nuisance as opposed to permanent? Yeah, because they have to do something about it. And that's as simple as that, right? If you can fix it, then it's temporary, and if you can't, then it's permanent. Yes. Um, and, and that is the way you need to think about it because permanent is going to carry with it potentially um, the, the uh, permanent damage award or, or maybe no remedy whatsoever depending on how it came about and the like. Um, then you've got to tell me what it's worth. And we've looked at this a bunch of different times in a bunch of different places, your whole notion of value, right? Um, so what is the value to Gary's mom that she can't sit on her deck over the course of the summer? Now, at least from, I don't know what, to what time that airport's open, but my guess is by the time it's not open, she doesn't want to sit on the deck anymore. She wants to go to bed. Um, how do we value that is just the loss to the individual for a period of time of some of the value of their property. It, it, it's easy when we look at the next cases to say, well, listen, if it's permanent, diminution in value with and without that nuisance. But here when we can abate it and, and you say, well, market value is one approach. We saw that before. But what if it's what's what I've lost? Uh, I've lost the use and enjoyment of my property or a portion of that. How, how are we going to value that loss? And that's one of the questions I had because it said to the extent of rental value, what if you don't have rental value? How can you measure that? Well, well, what if Sandy could rent other property type of thing? Is that what they're saying? Oh, is that what it means? I don't know. I'm asking you. Well, Sandy okay. says, I'm afraid to use my pool during the summer because these kids, okay. their pucks are all over the place all the time. And I've got 100 pucks to prove it. Right? 52. What's the value? Is it 52? Is that 52, what you're saying? 52, yes. 55. I thought you said 52. No, it was 52. Yeah. But You've actually also, counted them, huh? I listened to your client. So, so wait a minute, though. How do we value that? Yeah, is it is it her membership at the Y? Her membership at the health club? Plus a little more for her gas money to get there and back? I don't know. But, but this is part of your obligation, then, to prove the value of your loss. And so again, if we're looking at damages for the past injury, injunction against the future harm, you guys have to figure out how to put value on it. And, and as, as Sunshine said, well, one is med, mark, rental value, and to the extent the rental value is diminished. Well, house with the pool rents for 1500 house without a pool rents for 1000 I've lost $500 in value. I, I don't know what it is, but that's one way to approach it. Um, but what we know is you, you're the one at the end of the day that has to approach it. Let's talk about Myers versus Arnold, uh, which is the last case in your sequence here. Uh, again, injuries to real property. Uh, they've got 
25 acres, and I and again, I think this is kind of an interesting case for you to start to, uh, well, not start, but further your, as you start to focus on proof of damages, uh, proof of the loss and the like, um, that you, you really need to be prepared to be able to deal with in some detail. Um, knowing how we're, we're start to approach some of these issues. Uh, allegedly, she asked for a couple loads of concrete. She gets a lot more than a couple. Um, and uh, what she's saying is, that's precisely where I wanted to build my new house on these 25 acres. Um, because we've got a dispute now as to the, the value of the loss, right? Um, the defendant who dumped these loads of concrete. And here what they did is, uh, jury found that the dumping was wrongful. So we've gotten past the, did she ask for two or did she ask for as much as they could get? Um, awarded $12,000 in damages. Um, and the question is, does she get the cost of repair or the diminution in market value? And as you see here, it's a significant amount of money. Um, and, and I guess I've got other questions on this as well um, that, that we'll get to in a minute. She's got, is it 20 acres, 25? 20 acres, mark of land. And, a, and, and uh, uh, the value of each lake, acre of land is what? 750, 800 bucks? Yeah. Okay. And so this uh, concrete um, reinforcing rods and the rest uh, occupy about an acre of her land, right? But it is precisely the acre she intends to build that new home on. <laughs> and therefore her loss is a lot more than 750. Because what she says is this is temporary, and temporary can be fixed by removing the offensive structures, the concrete, the reinforcing rods and everything else. And the cost to remove it is gonna be kinda high. Um, the company made a fair amount on the construction project. I don't know whether why that's relevant. Um, unless it's punitive, right? Well, unless it's punitive, but I, I don't think this is not a punitive damage approach. This is simply trying to value the loss. Um, and actually, he introduced evidence that the cost to remove the concrete would be 18200 bucks. So, um, and the award is somewhat less than that. Um, and what we know is that it's somewhere between 60 to 70 loads of concrete, um, not at least the two that the plaintiff said she was looking for. Um, and then we've got one more piece of information that the uh, defendant allegedly saved just around $500 by dumping on the, the concrete on the land belonging to the plaintiffs as opposed to somewhere else. Um, at the close of the first day of trial, the defendant moved for a directed verdict, arguing the plaintiffs had failed to present the uh, evidence. What's a directed verdict? Judge instruction to um, that no reasonable jury would find that um, the facts that are at issue, um, that the prosecution, that the plaintiffs have not brought enough information to be able to find that a reasonable jury. Sufficient You're close. You're close. Don't give up on it. What, so what's, what is it? It is, um, the directive verdict is that no reasonable jury would find um, that the facts presented are enough to be able to have them uh, continue these particular charges. At the end, it gets a little sloppy. Yeah, just a touch. Based on the facts presented, no reasonable jury could find for the other side. Yeah, it's not just facts, because you've got to look at the evidence at this point, right? You've got to call it the evidence. Based on the evidence presented, that no reasonable jury could find for the other side. And in essence, what we're saying is there's been an insufficiency of proof on the issue, and therefore the judge can't, shouldn't allow the jury to proceed with the case because there's an insufficiency of that evidence. No reasonable jury on the basis of the evidence presented could find for the other side. Uh, what's, the, what's the number? Row 50. Row 50, yes it is. Um, and at the end of the trial, um, that motion is called? That is called motion for <laughs> directed verdict. No, it's a, it's a, oh, uh, 
Women, I'm sorry, right. At the, uh, at, after the jury comes back, that motion would be called motion for a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. Uh, the standard is the same. This is in state court. This was the state court of Tennessee in the state court of Massachusetts. That would be called in federal court. What's it called? Summary judgment. No, summary judgment is a pretrial device. Judgment notwithstanding. No, that's in the state court. That's the second half of this rule. Judgment is a matter of law. Judgment is a matter of law under Rule 50. It's the, both a directed verdict and a JNOV are called the same thing in the federal court, whether it's pre-verdict or post. And it's called motion for a judgment as a matter of law. The standard's the same. No reasonable jury on the basis of the evidence presented could find for the other side. And so we've got that motion after the first day of trial saying there's insufficient evidence here to uh, award any damages and find that the plaintiff should should win. Um, and so then the question is, well, what what evidence is there with respect to the appropriate value of the damages? And I'll tell you, I, this page 320 and 321, I've got so much highlighted on it that I'm not going to go over it all, but I think you guys should look at it carefully because it's talking about the appropriate measure of damages. And in this case, it makes a huge difference. If it's permanent or temporary, it's, the difference is huge. If it's uh, for commercial purposes as opposed to personal purposes, it's huge. I mean, it, is it really? I don't find it credible, but that's not my job since I'm not sitting on the jury, that it's on precisely this acre of those 25 that they intended to build that new home. But that's important for them to say, I think. Because if you own a bunch of commercial parcels, one acre is as good as any other acre. And so then the value of the loss should be the 750. I think that's a fair argument. If, however, though, that has personal value to you, such that they intend to build a home, as they said, and it is a temporary nuisance, then take it out. Restore the land to what it was. The value of those damages are 18,000. You really think that they're gonna take this 18,000, find someone to haul away the concrete, and build precisely on that spot, because I, I, I would take that 18,000, give someone $1,000 to truck a whole bunch of dirt in, cover the concrete, and I'll go a little further away. Would, wouldn't anyone? I mean, I've got $17,000 now to build my new home. I wonder about this. Did you, would you tell your client that there's this difference? That's, that's the spot? What did you intend to do with it? Not much. Maybe nothing. Well, that's not a good, that's not a good answer. Is it? Say it like that. And by the way, the, the cost to remove is grossly disproportionate to what they lost, isn't it? Yes. 750 an acre, all 20 acres aren't worth 18 grand. Are they? But they've struck pay dirt now. Do you nudge your client in this direction? Because they don't know how this how this works with respect to the damages. I would, I would think that when you have that initial consultation, you, you can't coach, you can't, you gotta be careful how you say it, but you can talk about the various differences in remedies. Cost to repair, cost to replace, uh, cost to move, you know, and have like a general, because you can kind of say, all right, you, I'm going to cost X. We got to figure out what the damages potentially are here. So what happened? You know, and then you could probably say, were you planning on doing anything with that acreage? Because if you weren't, the acreage is going to be worth less. If you're planning on doing something with development-wise, we might be able to get you more. You could probably say that, I would think, right? Do you all agree? Now, all he's doing is telling, informing them of their rights. Oh, right. Something like that. Well, if you're going to build a house on it, it would be worth X amount. But if you were just going to... So we could say that. Oh, I'm going to, I was going to build a house then. No? I mean, you've, you've helped create the testimony, haven't you? Or you've just educated them about their rights? Well, if the client said that as soon as, like, let's say the client responded as soon as I said that, okay, I was going to build a house there. You know, I would also advise my client that if they... they if they were indeed, then that's fine. But if they if they weren't, and they commit perjury, and it can prove they can, you know, they're liable. So I'd probably advise them that way too. So 
So they can just, they can say no, I really was. I'm like, just okay. as long as it, it's not showing that you're pushing them to make that testimony. Yeah. Well, when you say not pushing them, I mean, okay, you're not you haven't pushed them, but you've created kind of fertile ground for them to invent facts that provide them the greatest recovery. What, what are you shaking your head only a little bit like that for Sandy saying, no, I don't think I really have. But, but you have, right? There's a number of different ways we, they, they could potentially measure your damages. First of all, depending on whether it's permanent or temporary. Okay, we get past that. Now, if you were going to sell the acres off, just sell various parcels of your land at times, then the value of your loss might only be $750. But if you had plans for this land, as Gary put if you had plans for this land, then perhaps you can create the uh, can, we can we can create the damage model that says you know that's where I was going to put my house. Uh, it, it, the, the the concrete has to be removed in order to do that, and therefore the loss is twenty thousand or eighteen thousand as opposed to seven fifty. I mean the the potential loss here, if it's seven fifty versus eighteen, that that's, that's that's a huge huge difference, and. Most people, being people, are going to color their testimony to try and maximize their return. But you got to be careful if you're the lawyer. I agree. You're not coaching because then the, the client can say, he told me to say that. I don't disagree so with you at that's all, you careful. but you are coaching. Or, aren't you? Or are you just informing them as their rights? And if they choose to lie, that's up to them. But. But is that true? I mean, is that just the way lawyers talk? Yes. I'm not coaching them. I'm informing them of their rights and their options. And the fact is, they know best what they intended to do with that property, not me. But you could have accomplished the same thing by saying, well, what had you intended to do with it? Oh, yeah. We, we intended to sell the acres, or you intended to keep them. I mean, there were other ways to do it, but you were smart enough to be able to avoid getting the answer that you didn't want to hear. No, no, right? But but listen, we deal with this problem all the time. You deal with it in criminal law too. Do you really want to hear the information before they have enough information to make informed? But see, but that's isn't that the question? Informed decision about what? The facts? That's informed decisions about which tact they want to take. I mean, here it's it. This this is a great case for them, a great story for them to tell to maximize their return. It sounds a little, I'm a little skeptical of that, that this is accurate, and I think to some extent that you facilitated this. I don't think to some extent, I think you had to. Unless, it's, it's either 100% true or 100% BS. That's what I think. There's no middle ground. Either they really intended to build here, or they got this idea from you. When you started to look at your measure of damages and said, 750 or potentially 18,000. And, and that's what the insurance company was looking at and the, the defendants as well. Listen, there's, there's a bunch of different ways this can go. The likelihood is, even though it's costly, it is in fact temporary. And so first thing we're looking at is the cost to remove. The cost to remove this is gonna be expensive. And once we remove it, then they get their property back, probably also get rent for a period of time that the property was used as a storage facility. And, and that's a lot more money than saying, okay, we'll pay you 750 for the cost of an acre. I said, no, that's not good enough. This is not commercial, this is our home. And we do make a difference between people's homes and, and what they hold for commercial value. The 750 was 15 grand. I just wanted to calculate that. <clears throat> 750, oh, the whole, the entire value would have been 15 grand. But you didn't lose the house. But you didn't lose fifteen grand's worth. No, you, well, it is, and I think it was a while ago too. It was where? What period of time are we looking at here? Yeah. But then, so you have to argue that the cement pile made all my twenty acres useless. That's a different argument. Which is a tough argument to say because acre one isn't even going to see acre twenty in all likelihood. Yeah. It makes more sense. Just take the stone back. Back. Well, but that's the problem. The take the stone back is is an eighteen thousand uh, dollar job to pull it off, truck it out, put it somewhere else. They don't. They, they did that. 
I read that as they were trying to dump that construction site and said, you know, I, I know a 20 acre lot that we could put this on. <laughs> yeah. But but how? But why? Why would they take such a risk if the difference in value was only 500 to them, or they just didn't care? Figuring most homeowners are going to say, well, what can I do? What that? Contractors really don't care. Don't. No. I actually want you're gonna. I mean, would you um, would you would you make such a, a stereotype statement yeah. about any other group? By the way, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want a settlement. Five grand a small claims in New Hampshire, and it's been twelve years. And I should really get it because you got twenty years to get it. And I'm about ready to go to the clerk's office and get that application to enforce judgment. But yeah. What's taking you so long to? I know. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, 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 guess, I don't know. I should go do that. In fact, I was going to talk to you. You think the company is still in business at this point? Yeah. It should be. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so that that's my thing, bitterness towards low structure workers. Believe me, they wanted to dump that there. They did. I like that. Um, <laughs> you should wait, because co company... You should. They're not going to be in business. You know, generally, companies that don't do what they're supposed to, they're not going to be in business. Twelve years later, I'll be surprised oh, if they are. Fly. He's fly. I'm sure he's still in business. We should look him up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>